His, uh, his willingness to join us this afternoon in what's a very busy time at the university is something to uh, be commended. Professor Cowan, thank you so much for uh, sharing a little bit about your research and your interest and in, in really giving our audience a, a, a sliver of what it's like to be a faculty member at Johns Hopkins and where your interests come from and so forth. So I leave it to you and uh, everyone enjoy. Thank you so much and I hope everybody can hear me okay. For the beginning part out here, I have my video on, but then what I'll do is I'll, uh, the, the moderators and I will turn off our video during part of the presentation to make sure everybody can get a good full screen view of the presentation. And then I'll switch back from time to time to the um, uh, video so that I can show you um, uh, some of the ideas that I'm gonna be uh, lecturing about today in uh, practice. So this is both gonna be a story about the research that I do in my lab, but also a little bit about how I got excited about this research and, and the sort of circuitous, circuitous path uh, of my personal interest that took me to something like uh, studying uh, robots in the brain. And I got there by way of juggling. This is me in 1988 in Delaware, Ohio. I'm the guy in the ridiculous shorts on the left there, uh, passing clubs with my uh, high school juggling partner on the right, Rick Chapin. Um, and uh, really, this was the culmination of my uh, interest in how things move. I've always been fascinated by how things move. For example, everything such as this common household, you know, everyday telephone, um, turns out that, that just this little simple device can reveal really interesting properties about the physical world. For example, when I flip this device, see if I can flip it in the screen. When I flip this device, which is not something I recommend that you do with your phone, um, it stays parallel um, to the initial place that I started. It keeps spinning like this. If I, but if I flip it about this other axis, then as I flip it, it'll twist around the middle. And so let me see if I can demonstrate that. Some, there, 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 a little twist. There's some wonderful videos of that, of people doing that in space where they can spin it very slowly. And you see this nice little twist that occurs around the middle. When I was in eighth grade, I uh, began doing that with hammers and books and other things. And I would just, really perplexed about why the object would flip for a while and then do a twist around the middle. And so just those little everyday observations led me to an interest in juggling. Um, and then later in college and then in graduate school, I began to put together the ingredients that make something like juggling possible. So first of all is the physics. You've, many of you will have learned uh, by now the idea that, that when you apply a force to an object, that's F, and it has a certain mass, that's m, and then it uh, speeds up at a certain rate, that's the acceleration a, that um, f equals ma. And what that really means is that as I push harder on an object, that's the increase in force, then uh, that object will tend to go faster if you keep, it tend to accelerate faster if you keep the mass the same. Which we all know that if you push on a larger object, it'll accelerate more slowly for the same force. Well, that very simple equation can lead to entire dissertations of work trying to understand the intricacies of how things move. But physics isn't the whole story um, because in juggling in particular, timing is everything. Uh, F equals MA is really um, uh, part of the puzzle, but it's not only what you do, but when you do it that matters. And then lastly, um, and I think the, the, the ingredient about this whole picture that I've spent most of my career devoted to is understanding feedback. That is, how do I take that motion that I've seen in the real world, process it through my visual system, my touch system, and so forth, through my brain, my brain then does something with that information, and then it changes the commands that it sends down to my muscles in order to react to that object. Closing a feedback loop. And so that's gonna be the main story of uh, today. So I'm gonna um, do one more slide here. So first, the first part, physics, F equals MA. This requires a demo. I'm gonna stop staring, sharing screen to make sure my screen is large. And you should hopefully get a nice good view of me here. So um, here's F equals MA in action. I've got a ball here, I'm gonna apply a force, vertical force, and it's gonna accelerate upward. And after I let go of it, um, gravity will continue to do its work. It'll follow gravity's rainbow and come back down. And I'm gonna apply another kind of uh, force known as a torque, which is around my body axis using my feet, and I'm gonna spin around and catch the ball. Hopefully you can see that okay. And so if I continue to apply these forces in sequence with multiple objects, I can 
change their motions kind of arbitrarily by applying these forces. But that's not the whole picture. I said that timing was important because obviously if I throw the ball and then reach out to catch it, I'm not gonna get it, right? I have to get the timing of that correct. And the application of force at the appropriate time are the two ingredients. And I'm gonna go back to my slideshow here. Share screen. Asking for my password. Okay, so physics is important, but timing is important too. It's not just when you do it, uh, what you do, it's when you do it that matters. But physics and timing are not the whole picture. My daughter, when she was six years old, uh, asked a really intriguing question. She said, Mommy, why is it easier to walk on our feet than on our hands, even though our hands and feet are the same size? And you can see from this little picture, this is Genevieve when she was about six, doing a, um, some sort of handstand maneuver. And you can see that it's true, her hands and feet are about the same size. Um, and so, uh, and she was clearly plenty strong to do a handstand, but it was much harder for her to do a handstand than it was to stand on her feet. And it wasn't because she wasn't strong enough, it was because of one last really important ingredient, which is feedback. So our senses, whether they're our eyes, our ears, our sense of touch, our sense of smell, they take in information about uh, the objects in the world and our positions relative to those objects. So for example, our eyes see the balls. Or when you're standing and doing, when you're standing upright, you can see the world around you. And if you begin to fall, you can sense that with your eyes. The, the, um, the world begins to look like it's tipping over. And you might have actually been in a scenario where um, you were in a virtual reality or something like that. And when there's an optical movement, it sometimes makes you feel like you're falling. Well, you take that sensory information, it goes into your brain. Your brain is then doing all these subconscious things, processing that sensory information. Uh, it sends the information down to your body through your muscles. And in this case, in my example, uh, you then use your muscles and your body to propel the juggling balls. But it's not a one-way street. Then you see the juggling balls and what you just did to them, and that feeds back into your sensory system. And so this diagram, this is called a feedback control diagram. And these diagrams are both intuitive in that you can see how the information goes from one stage of the body to the other, back out into the world, and then feeds back to the senses. But you can actually make this very rigorous scientific uh, model based on this diagram. It's not just a picture that explains things intuitively, but we use this as a mathematical tool. Um, actually, believe it or not, these kinds of graphs, these graphical pictures are actually a mathematical tool to explain um, how feedback control works. So I went to college. I was an avid juggler at that time. I went to college to study electrical engineering. Um, and uh, with that process, you do a lot of physics and, and mathematics and so forth. And I thought, uh, when I was done with that, I, uh, I thought, I'm going to go off and do a PhD, find somebody to do a PhD with that can teach me the concepts of physics, timing, and feedback. And I'm going to build the world's greatest juggler. I was still an avid juggler at that point, And I wanted to put those two things together. And it turns out that up at the University of Michigan at that time, there was a scientist by the name of Dan Kodachek who ultimately became my PhD advisor. And he and his students had built this incredible juggling robot that I'm gonna show you a video of on the next slide. And here's a set of pictures of it that were in uh, the Scientific American magazine um, back in the late 80s um, before I did my PhD. And here's a, an old video of that robot juggling two ping pong balls using a single paddle. And what's remarkable about this is even as a juggler, it's extremely hard to bounce two tennis balls, let's say, on a tennis racket or two ping pong balls uh, uh, on a ping pong paddle. So this robot uh, built by uh, Al Rizzi and Dan Kodacek and, and others um, based on some, some amazing work by this uh, guy, Martin Bueller, um, all of these people are now famous in the robotics world. They, you might have seen Boston Dynamics robots. Well, uh, a lot of the people that built these machines, uh, turns out I picked an incredibly awesome lab where a lot of these people went off and, and are now creating the most exciting robots that you see on YouTube these days. So this machine is incredible, but I thought, okay, I, when I went to that lab, I thought I'm gonna make this even better. It's gonna juggle five clubs and I'm gonna go on Letterman or the uh, uh, late night TV and I'm gonna uh, 
be able to juggle with the robot. But I failed, and the bugler never got past two balls, and juggling robots still stink. Even to this day, there are no really good juggling robots out there. There's a few that look cool to a video, but compared to an actual human juggler, they still sink. Still sink. So now my students and I try to figure out why we can do things like juggle. And I'm going to tell you three little stories about the science that we do in my lab based on, based on this idea of physics, timing, and uh, feedback control, and put those three things together um, uh, in three different little stories. The first story is how I got in, in, in started in studying biology, which was studying the lowly, disgusting cockroach. So this is a, a picture from the uh, cover of the journal where we, made, where we published our paper. And um, that's a little cockroach uh, running along a wall really, really fast using its antenna to feed back and control itself running along the wall. And then I'm gonna tell you a fish story about an incredible fish that we study in my lab. And lastly, I'm gonna close the loop, so to speak, and talk about a study that we did studying human juggling. And as I go along, I'll try to point out to some of the many really important people who uh, have either contributed or in this case even advised this work. This is my postdoctoral advisor, Bob Full at UC Berkeley where I studied these cockroaches. And I'm gonna show a video and hopefully the video comes across clearly. There's a way to optimize for video, which I think I have set. So here's a cockroach that is running along that black wall. And if you look closely, and I'll pause the video so you can see, oops. Here's, here you can see at the beginning, this long slender thing is its antenna and it's actually about as long as the whole cockroach body. And this cockroach is running along in complete darkness. We have special cameras so that we can see it running along using just its antenna to measure where this is. And yet, as it comes through this little corner, there's two different cameras view, as it comes through that little corner, it turns the corner without missing a beat. Really, really smooth and efficient locomotion. So we uh, studied that and we described that in terms of one of these nice feedback control diagrams. And these are many of the, not, but not even all of the incredible students that have worked on, worked on this project over the last 15 years. Um, and one particularly surprising discovery is that so much of the, of the control is actually built into the incredible antenna physics. So in other words, what we discovered is that the cockroach antenna is actually designed through evolution. It's been refined over many, many, many generations of evolution to actually make the problem of following along, along a, a surface which is very necessary for the animal survival as it's trying to escape a predator. It runs over out of any open area and fo follows along uh, surfaces until it can find a crack to hide in. And uh, they live in, um, uh, in caves and in leaf litter and other things where they need to quickly run out of the open view of a predator and run along a wall. Believe it or not, there are actually animals that would choose to eat these things. So they have to do this to survive. And it turns out these, ante these antenna have these incredible little segments um, each one of these antenna has about 170 segments. And on each segment, there are these little tiny spines that do all the sensing. But not only do they do the sensing, they help the antenna maintain a nice little curved posture as it runs along a wall. And so one of the ways we discovered that was through robotics. This is my student, Ali John uh, Demur, who's now working for a local medical device startup. And he built a robotic physical model of an antenna. And he put these little spines on there. And what you can see is in this mechanical model that the robotic antenna and the biological antenna generate the same backwards curve if they get if they get started pointing forward they always curve around and end up being curved backwards and that curving backwards allows the antenna to conform to the surface and measure uh, really accurately where the animal is relative to the surface and allows it to follow the wall uh, really closely so how, what lessons could we take from this lowly cockroach first of all the control is simple fast and efficient the antenna simply must measure the distance and rate of approach to the wall. That was our first discovery. And then second, it turns out that a lot of the feedback control is actually embedded in the physics. The physics of the antenna makes the control simpler for the animal. And evolution has tuned that antenna physics to simplify control. So that was our, our discovery about the cockroaches. And now I'm gonna turn your attention to uh, a really incredible creature that I began studying with uh, Eric Fortune. Eric Fortune was a professor at Johns Hopkins 15 years ago. He's since moved to the New Jersey Institute of Technology where he's a professor there. Um, 
And uh, he studies the weekly electric fish and got me involved in studying this organism. And it turns out it's an incredible animal for studying sensory motor control. Uh, and what is the electric fish? Well, if we look at a little schematic here of the electric fish, you'll see that all over the surface of the skin, there's these little black stipples, these little black dots that we've drawn to illustrate that they actually can sense electricity with their skin. So they sense electricity, and uh, what electricity are they sensing? Well, you might have heard of electric eels. Electric eels generate electricity in the water, but they actually use it to stun their prey. These fish generate an electric field that's quite weak. So weak that it doesn't stun their prey, but strong enough to allow them to sense their environment, like an electric flashlight. So they have good eyes, but they also have this electric sense. And then the last thing that makes them really unique from a control theory and engineering perspective, trying to understand them, is they've got this incredible fin along their underside that uh, allows them to swim nearly equally well forward and backward. So they're these incredible all directional or so-called omnidirectional swimmers. And they have these two really cool parallel sensing systems, the visual system like we, like we have, plus this extra sensory system, like a sixth sense of electricity. So to explain this even further, I'm gonna play a, a short one and a half minute or so video that was produced uh, uh, by a, an outfit called Science Nation with help from the National Science, with funding from the National Science Foundation to produce this video. An electric eel can generate enough current to stun its prey. These so-called weakly electric fish generate electricity. Now I'm going to pause. Whoops, I'm going to pause on this. Actually, I, one thing I didn't test is whether the audio of this video is coming through. So maybe the organizers can let me know if that's working. It is. Yes. Okay. Great. Great. I'll do it again. An electric eel can generate enough current to stun its prey. These so-called weakly electric fish generate electricity too, but not enough to do any harm. With the proper equipment, you can even hear an electric hum. There's a small organ in the tail of the weakly electric fish that generates an electric field, and then that electric field envelops the entire animal. Researchers at Johns Hopkins University are studying the weekly electric knife fish in the wild and in the lab. They say these fish use their electric field as a sixth sense. When an object passes through the field, receptors on its skin detect it. The fish also use their electro sense to navigate and communicate. Each fish generates its own unique frequency, which can change when other knife fish are near. When the two fish come by, their two pitches begin to interact, much like two singers' pitches would interact. And engineers at Northwestern University are developing a highly agile robot that may one day use a similar sixth sense to monitor the health of coral reefs or navigate the dark, murky waters of an oil spill. I'm Miles O'Brien. So that video is available on YouTube. You can check that out if, in, in a slightly longer version that they published on YouTube. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that fish, but I thought that was a really well-produced short way of kind of getting all the main features of these animals. Um, but the thing that makes them so pow powerful, believe it or not, is a simple behavior that they do where they actively try to stay hidden. So here you see an electric fish staying inside of a standard bathroom uh, pipe called a PVC pipe. That's the material it's made out of, PVC. But it's just a plastic pipe that you could go buy at Home Depot, cut to a few inches long, and the fish is trying to hide in it, probably because the fish is, like a lot of animals, just trying to avoid being predated. You know, it's, it's a, um, in, the, in its natural environment, it would be under constant uh, uh, threat from other organisms. And so in the lab, it has this very natural almost habitual behavior where it tries to stay hidden inside this tube. And as a result, here Dr. Fortune, Eric Fortune is, is moving this tube back and forth and you can see the fish actually actively swimming to stay inside the tube. And when I watch that video, it looks like the fish is attached to the tube, but it's not. It's only attached to the tube by closed loop control. It's measuring where the tube is using its vision and electrosense and changing its swimming with that ribbon fin I showed you to swim forward and backward. And so, We've studied that. This is um, a few of the people that have been involved in that project. We've studied that, 
and, uh, by using not, not a human hand to move the tube back and forth, but a robot um, that controls a moving uh, PVC pipe. And so what we see here is a bottom view of the fish. Now, instead of the side view, we're seeing the bottom and this is its big long fin. You can see how incredible it is in, in moving back and forth. I hope that comes cl pretty clear on the screen. And then this is one of those PVC pipes, but we've actually cut it off on the bottom so that you can see uh, where the fish is, which I've indicated with the yellow dot, and where the uh, shuttle is, or where, what we call the shuttle or the refuge, which is the PVC pipe, we can see where that is. And then we can measure the fish's performance in tracking random movements of the tube and actually use that to develop a closed loop model like this, where we model vision, uh, electrosense, what the brain is doing, and what the physics are doing. And then as well, the closed loop, just like that closed loop diagram I talked about with the juggling. And so um, I'll start by giving a little example of how we might do that. So in engineering, there's an idea called a Bode plot. Bode was a, uh, was a control theorist, a very famous control theorist's name um, from the early 20th century. Um, and he developed this way of graphically making another, again, making a picture to describe the physics of what was going on. And one of the things that I want to tell you is that you know, math might seem very boring sometimes, just doing a bunch of calculations over and over. But as you move more into more and more advanced math, you can do so um, graphically and have it still mean the same thing as the equations. And the thing that I love about math, you know, it's not the arithmetic. You got to get good at that. You know, it's not even the, the algebra. It's the connection between algebra and graphs. And when you begin to be able to make those uh, connections, you begin to be able to see math in a whole new light. And so I'm going to explain some pretty sophisticated math that would generally be taught to graduate students uh, at a university. But because of this graphical approach, I think um, there's a really a nice way to understand it. So what, what, what I have here is a graph that I'm going to first show one video um, where I move the tube back and forth at something called 0.1 hertz. A hertz means a cycle per second. So 0.1 hertz means that it actually takes 10 seconds for this tube to move back and forth. Then what we do is we track how much does the fish move back and forth in that same amount of time. If the fish moves the same amount as the, as the tube does, then we say that its gain is one. That is, it's moving, if you take how far did the fish move and divide it by how far did the tube move, if that's one, that means the fish is moving exactly the same amount. Well, let's look at our graph here. At, this is the frequency, this is the x-axis is frequency, and 0 0.1 is that very slow frequency. And lo and behold, the, the gain is almost one. It's moving almost as much as the tube is moving. Now, this is a really tricky concept. The phase is how, basically how much the animal is lagging behind. And so now I'm gonna actually stop the share and show my video, or maybe I just turn on my video. Oh, I guess I have my video on. I thought I stopped it. Okay, good. So the, the fish is in the tube and it is, if it's lagging behind, if I move the tube and the fish takes a while to get going like this, then we would say that it has a phase lag. And the phase lag, I'm not gonna worry about the units, they're, they're, it's measured in degrees, but a phase lag that is a lot would mean a number down, way down here. And so you can actually see that as we increase the frequency, the phase lag is increasing, meaning the fish is having a hard time keeping up, which makes sense. Not only is it moving a lot less, almost one-tenth as much, it's not able to keep up. And we can see that as we increase the frequency. Here's this, the, these two data points right here. As I increase the frequency, you can see that the fish is not moving back and forth nearly as much now, and it's kind of lagging behind the tube. And as I increase the frequency even more, now we're out at, at two cycles per second. I didn't tell you this, but the video is actually playing back half as fast. So it's on your screen, it'll only look like it's going back and forth one time a second because it's a slow motion video. Um, the fish is barely moving. It is moving though. And you can see that its fin is doing a lot of back and forth motions to try to make the fish stay inside the tube. So, and it's that graph that actually tells us a lot about how this animal's closed loop controller works. One of the things that we found in this study is that figuring out what that controller is, what is the brain doing of this animal? 
is really sensitive to what we know about the physics. If we don't know how the fluid moves around the fish and don't know how the fin works, it's almost impossible to figure out what the brain is doing. And the reason for that is because of the feedback. And I didn't explain exactly why this is, but one of the funny things about feedback, and I'm gonna, I can't see my own self, so I think I need to, to know where I am. Hopefully you can see this. One of the funny things about feedback is that it changes the dynamics of a system. So here's a juggling club. If I just allow physics to do its job, the, the juggling club always tends to fall over. It's, it's almost impossible to get it to stand upright. But if I apply feedback, I can stabilize it and make it want to stay straight up. Okay? How do I do that? I'm seeing the, the, the top of the club, and as it begins to fall, I'm making all these micro adjustments with my hand to keep my hand under the club. And so what happens is that the physics end up coupling with the brain in a way that the whole system acts differently than, than the sum of the parts. You can't just analyze the brain and the physics by themselves. You have to put them together if you want to understand what's going on. Um, and in biology, feedback is the rule, not the exception. All living systems use feedback, whether it's feedback to keep your temperature at 98.6 or it's feedback to keep you from falling over. If I turn off my feedback system, I'm going to fall over. I'm an inverted pendulum just walking around. All that subconscious feedback is constantly at play at all levels of biology. And so it's impossible to figure out what the brain is doing, the control system, which is the brain, without also understanding the physics. So we took the time to try to figure out that physics um, in the electric fish. And we, this is my former uh, PhD student, Shaheen Safadi. And he studied the incredible waves that this fish makes pushing the water inward toward the middle. So this fish is sitting still, and you can see that its fin is actually paddling against itself, which seems really counterintuitive. Why would the animal have part of its fin swimming forward and part of its fin swimming backwards? And this really perplexed us as well. Um, and I think I'll skip, well, no, I'll still go ahead and show this little video. So here you can see that when we, you can't see the water flowing, but in, in this video, the water is actually flowing in a, we have a, something called a flow tunnel, which allows us to make water continually run by like a stream. And when we do that, the fish changes how much of the fin is going one way versus the other. And that makes sense. Now the fish has to swim forward. So it can't have the same amount of fin going forward as backward or it wouldn't be swimming forward. And likewise, I told you these fish can swim backward. If we flow the water in the opposite direction, then, the, then it has more of the fin uh, going uh, from left to right on your screen. And you can actually graph that again. These graphs are really important. You can look, look at the swimming speed on the x-axis and see how much does that fin shift from being mostly swimming forward to mostly swimming backwards. And you can see this incredible linear, almost linear trend in that data, meaning to swim forward, the fish just moves that little point back and back and back on its fin in a very simple control strategy. Well, you might have seen in the video, there was a reference to this gentleman, uh, Professor Malcolm McIver at Northwestern University. When we were studying these electric fish, um, I, I knew about his work and I knew that he had been building a ribbon fin robot that we thought we might be able to test some of our mathematical models on because, you know, math is great, but it's also just a model. Sometimes it's nice to have a physical system that you can actually do a test with. So we actually collaborated with him to study the physical system the biological system in my lab, and then a mathematical model to try to connect the two together. And so we could do these cool experiments where we actually take his robot and measure the forces, which is really hard to do with a fish. Or we could have the robot swimming freely back and forth and, and measure its motion in, in ways that were harder to do uh, with the animal. We could do some of it, but not nearly as much accuracy as we could do with the robot. And uh, the long story short is that we discovered um, a really important idea from biology. So there are two really important features of systems. One is how maneuverable they are. How fast can they change direction? And a really maneuverable system like say, a running back on a football team or a lacrosse player who has to make a quick turn, uh, having maneuverability is really important. But stability is also really important. That is, uh, how do you maintain yourself uh, to be stable from an external force? And uh, it's often thought in engineering that you can't have both. And in fact, airplanes are often designed to be unstable 
so that they can be more maneuverable. And so the graph that you get is like this. If you increase the stability on the x-axis, you actually have very low maneuverability. Or if you increase the maneuverability, you have very low stability. So you can either have a system that's very maneuverable but not very stable, or you can have a system that's very stable and won't fall over, but you know, because it's so stable, it also can't change direction very fast. And so much of engineering design is based on this idea that there's a trade-off between being quick on your feet and agile and maneuverable and being stable like a big heavy rock. Well, it turns out that you'd really like to be up here where you're both stable and maneuverable, and that's where the fish lies. The fish lies has figured out a way of bypassing what engineers have thought, which is that there's a trade-off between stability and maneuverability. And if you're willing to put in just the right amount of extra energy, you can get both. And that's what they've done. In fact, the Wright brothers thought about it this way. They thought in order to make the right flyer work, it wasn't about getting enough aerodynamical lift. People already knew how to do that, but their, but their airplanes would always crash. And their airplanes wouldn't crash because they weren't stable. They would actually crash because they were too stable and they couldn't be steered to avoid obstacles. So the, when the, this is a, a fact you may not ever learn in school um, until much later in life. In fact, it's, it's, it, I had to convince a lot of engineers about Orville uh, and Wilbur's early writings about this, that they really thought that the only way to make an airplane successful and given the way fixed wing airplanes work, this trade off is real, they had to make the, the, the right flyer actually unstable. And that way it became maneuverable. And so where did the stability come from? How, why, if it's unstable, it's gonna crash. Well, the thing is an airplane has a pilot and a pilot creates the feedback control system that makes the airplane stay stable. So because they made it unstable, it was maneuverable, and then they have the human in the loop steer it and stabilize it. And that's how the Wright Flyer became successful is because they understood the need for feedback control. They understood that you need to put a pilot in an unstable system uh, so that it can be maneuverable. Now, there's some reasons why an airplane has to have this trade-off and the fish doesn't, um, and that's something maybe we can talk about in the Q&A if people are interested in. So we have a new model for the physics of uh, knife fish. Um, and the way the fish overcomes the stability maneuverability trade off is that it creates these inward waves that fight each other. It's much like a linebacker standing with their feet spread apart so that they could take a hit and not fall over, but also their feet are apart so they can uh, uh, create a quick change in their movement direction. So they get both stability and maneuverability by creating these forces that are pushing apart. Um, and then uh, the other thing is this idea of the linking between what the brain does and what the physics do. The brain sets up these waves of activity or constantly forcing against themselves, and it actually makes the control simpler by giving you stability and maneuverability. So the brain reaches out through the body to actually simplify control. And then the last story that I wanna tell you is about how I, took all these advances that we were trying to make in understanding closing the loop in the brain using robotic systems and robotic models um, to get insight into my original passion that got me interested in the physics of motion in the first place, and, um, which is juggling. And so um, we managed to get a, a paper published in the Journal of Neurophysiology. And believe it or not, that cover is actually the cover, uh, is actually a picture of my graduate school juggling partner. So when we got this paper accepted in the journal, um, one of the things that the journal accepts is, uh, it's kind of like a competition. You get to submit a candidate for the cover photo. And I thought, well, what better thing to put on the Journal of Neurophysiology than somebody juggling? And I called my old friend, Josh Casey, who's a professional juggler um, that I was fortunate enough to, to be able to juggle with when I was in graduate school. Um, and I said, hey, Josh, I saw your website. And you have this great picture where you're juggling these three orange balls. Do you want to be on uh, the cover of a, of a neuroscience magazine. He was like, that sounds totally cool. So he sent me a high resolution version and we submitted it and he got on the cover. So that's kind of connected my two worlds. So um, um, you could also have, uh, this was years ago, so you probably didn't see it, but we also had a little article in um, the Baltimore Sun uh, about that as well. So, uh, and these are the folks that worked on it with me, including um, Professor Alice Nokomura, who was at Johns Hopkins, but since moved to Stanford University, uh, and two former PhD students of mine. 
So this part I want to tell you about in real life. So what the, the timing issue and the feedback issue are really uh, come together for this project. So what we had people do is in a virtual reality environment, I'm going to do it in real reality, in a virtual reality environment, we had people do something very much like that juggling robot I showed you. People had to paddle the ball up and down. But it was in virtual reality. So they used like a joystick and they moved the paddle up and down. And on the screen, they watched their virtual paddle hit the ball and bounce it up and down on the screen. Well, the powerful thing about using virtual reality is that the, it, it allows us to change the physics and also change the timing in order to understand the control. When you do something in virtual reality, you're not held to the same rules of physics as you are in real reality. So we could do little clever tricks like instead of when, when we had the ball hit the paddle, the paddle could create a little vibration to give you the sense that, the, that you would actually hit the ball, okay? And what we did in a combination of studies is we examined if we, if we don't give them that touch feedback, what happens? And also we could do something really tricky and make the, the feedback timing of when the ball hit the hand, we could actually have that signal coming a little bit late or a little bit early to trick the, the brain into thinking the ball had already landed in their hand and then see how do we adjust our movement. And what we found is people really rely on touch feedback. If you don't have that touch feedback, people got much worse at the task. And we were able to figure that out through this combination of studies, but let me give you an example. So you have to trust me that I'm not cheating, but I'm gonna juggle right now and I'm gonna close my eyes. Give me a second here, I gotta get stable. So my eyes are closed now. So, oh, this one, it happens, it's live TV. So I can't do it nearly as well as I can with my eyes open, but here I am juggling with my eyes closed. And how did I do that? For four or five cycles, I did it no problem. And it wasn't because I wasn't using feedback. It's because I could make micro adjustments to the timing of my pattern because I could feel exactly when the ball hit my hand. So even just touch feedback alone can be enough for uh, control. Unfortunately, I dropped, but hey, gravity works. That's important, physics. So it's the, the role of timing and it's sensory measurement through touch that allows our brain to, to close the feedback loop to help us regulate our sense of time with the sense of timing of the world. And that integration of uh, touch feedback with, um, um, with visual feedback, I think is really important. And your brain is doing this all the time. You're using your vestibular, well, you everybody's gotten dizzy before, and what's happening when you get dizzy is you mix up the fluids in your inner ear and mix up the neuro the neural signals coming out of the, the uh, organs in your inner ear called your vestibular system. They give you a sense of balance. That's all subconscious. But you're also not only using that, you're using your eyes um, and you're using the sensors in your legs. You may not already know that you have a sixth sense called proprioception, which is how your brain can measure your body's position. If, if I tell you to touch your hand to your nose with your eyes closed, you can do that no problem because you can actually sense where your arm is. And there are people that lose the ability to do proprioception and then they don't know where their limbs are unless they see them with their hands. I mean, see them with their eyes. They have to actually watch their hands pick something up. They can't just reach for something and catch it or pick it up just using not the measurement of their proprioception. So you're using proprioception, touch, vision, uh, vestibular, all these senses at the same time when you're doing something like balancing. So, um, that is what I wanted to tell you about uh, juggling. Turn off this and go back to the screen share. So um, just a last little plug for some of the more recent people that have been in my lab, um, some of which you saw in this, in this talk. And uh, if you wanna learn more, you can go to my lab's webpage it's the Locomotion in Mechanical and Biological Systems Laboratory, or LIMS. Um, and uh, uh, it's lims.lcsr.jhu.edu. Hopefully the organizers can send out some of this info to everybody who registered uh, afterwards. And then um, uh, I want to thank you, but uh, I also want to um, show you, give you some resources that we can also make available. One is there's some really great videos out there about how to juggle, but I'm going to give some tips right now. Um, 
And also juggling balls can get kind of pricey, but there's some really inexpensive ways to make good juggling balls. Um, uh, my favorite actually is just to get tennis balls. And there's a good video about this. Get tennis balls, cut a little slit in them, maybe a centimeter long, half an inch roughly. Uh, open it up and put rice in it and then super glue the ball closed. And it'll make it a nice good, uh, tennis ball is too light, but if you add some rice to it, you can make it just right. And you can, before gluing it up, you can experiment to what feels good in your hand and you know, has a little bit of a thud when it hits your hand. Um, so we can make that video, uh, hopefully send that link out to you. I'll leave it up for a little while. Uh, and then there's another uh, cool technique that I've never tried that looked really promising, which is to use balloons. Uh, similar thing where you fill it with rice, um, uh, like shown here. You could probably almost figure that out without watching the video, but the video is pretty cool. I, I watched that before today. And then if you want, um, you can go to my favorite, uh, or a number of places sell juggling balls, but my favorite juggling balls are made by Renegade. These are, these are Renegade juggling balls that I was juggling with earlier. So I wanna give you a few tips about juggling and then we can open up for Q&A. And then I'll do a little juggling demonstration. So the video that I sent you does exactly this, um, teaches exactly the same thing that I'm gonna teach you here, but you can pause it and watch it over and over. But I'll give you a couple little pointers. So juggling in the most basic sense, everybody thinks about juggling as being a clown pattern where you, the, the, the classic animations that you would see on cartoons of a clown juggling always look like the ball shoots across and then goes over. But actually juggling is symmetric. You throw each, you throw the ball the same, either with both hands. And you wanna stand with your feet about shoulder width apart, with your eyes looking just a little bit above eye level and then throwing the ball so that it peaks just above your head. And it makes kind of a figure eight pattern. The ball makes sort of a figure eight pattern between your hands. And each ball should be thrown, I mean, each hand should throw the ball exactly the same height. And it should be very, very comfortable. And you don't wanna be watching the ball down in your hand. You've gotta really count on your proprioception to know where your arm is. And I would say that you should do this until this is comfortable. And this could take, you know, you might want to do this for five minutes a day, every day, for a couple of weeks, who cares? Don't get too impatient about jumping to the next step. Really make this be easy. This should be so easy by the time you go to the next step. The next step is with two balls. You're gonna throw, have one in each hand. You're gonna throw one ball about this high. Wait till it starts to come down not sooner, and then throw this ball underneath in, this, in the exact opposite arc going the other direction. So the same throws that you did with one ball, but now you're gonna do one and then it next. Notice it was not fast. I didn't go, it was one, two. Throw, throw, very slow. And the video that I linked to demonstrates that. And you want to be able to start that with either hand, right, left. And this takes a while. That I, uh, when I work with, when I've done group juggling lessons, this can take people an hour or two to really get good at. Sometimes more. I've had people take a week to figure this out. And it's okay. People learn different parts of juggling at different speeds. Um, be lots of drops involved with getting this. It also depends on how old you are and how many sports you do and all those sorts of things. So, but everybody can learn to juggle. One, two, one, two. And then once you get that down, and that'll take a while, you take three, two in one hand, and one in the other. First thing to do is actually just to work with being able to throw one ball of the two out of your hand. And you can pick, this you only really need to be able to learn to do with one hand. So for example, if you're right-handed, you might wanna just put the two balls in your right hand. You don't need to be able to start with your other hand just yet. You know, eventually, if you learn four or five balls, you'll want to be able to do that. But for starters, you just need to be able to do, take two balls in your dominant hand, throw one of them. And I do that by having one of the balls pinned with these, uh, the um, pinky and the ring finger. And then the other balls, the other ball is with my thumb, index, and middle finger. And then that's the one I'm going to release first. Then once I release that, the really subtle part is I gotta then roll this ball down into my hand. And so that actually takes some practice too. Release and get the other ball ready. Release and then get the other ball ready. And then once you can do that, 
you know, then we can go back and do a few of these to practice to warm back up. Then you take two balls in your dominant hand, one ball in this hand, and you're always going to start with the hand that has two balls. You throw that, that ball first, and now that two ball pattern just repeats over and over again. Throw, 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 throw. And it really is something that you can learn in a week's time. Some people learn it in a day. Some people learn it in a month. Um, but it's something that if you put 20 minutes a day in, most people will, will get pretty close to learning it in a week's time. Okay? So there's three. Do a couple little tricks for you. I had five here. Where'd the system go? The one I dropped behind the piano. Hang on. All right. Five balls. Never been done before on a Zoom meeting by a Johns Hopkins professor, as far as you know. That's that physics and timing again. There you go. And lastly, you saw these juggling pins. This is a little different. If you want to get into juggling pins after you learn juggling balls, these are harder to make well because the balance is really important. Um, but they can range in price from around 10 bucks a piece to I mean, minor professional clubs, so they're a little bit more expensive. But you can get them pretty reasonably priced online. But you want to get decent ones because otherwise they don't flip very well. You want them to be lightweight and easy on the hands. And the difference here is that now the height of the throw has to be synchronized with the amount of flip, or it won't land back in your hand at the right time. So that's why these are harder. So higher, th higher uh, throws means now more, more flip. So I've got these are doubles, meaning I'm each club is going around two times. And I'll end with a triple. That's it. So I'm happy to take uh, any questions. And I think uh, Simeon will help with that. Yep. Well, first, uh, I, I wish that we had all 300 plus people who could, you could see them and see the applause because I, I want to thank you. That, that was really, uh, you know, just judging from the, from the questions, you have sparked a, a lot of thought and curiosity. So let's just jump in Thanks. Uh, with one that is, uh, Going back to this principle of stability and maneuverability, the, the question is, does this explain why it's easier to juggle standing up than sitting down? That's really interesting. Um, well, uh, does the stability and maneuverability, I love questions that I really am not sure until I really think about it, whether or not that's a good question. So um, let me just, uh, I'm a, well, one of my limit, one of my limitations, maybe also one of my strengths, is I'm a very physically oriented person. So I have to actually like almost try it to kind of think through what you're saying. So the question was: Is the stability and maneuverability somehow related um, to why it's? Or is, is maybe an explanation for why it's easier to juggle standing than sitting? And for those that haven't juggled, that's absolutely true. And in, in fact, uh, you'll note this is an, this is my demonstration of a, of a beginning juggler. Right? You'll find that. When you learn to juggle, you start walking around, right? And the, so the question is, is that related to the stability and maneuverability? I think what it is, is that our um, being, walking around actually gives you more what engineers call degrees of freedom. Meaning that, you know, my arm, I can bend my elbow, I can bend my shoulder in a couple different motions, I can bend my wrist. These are all independent motions. We call those degrees of freedom but I have a limited range of, of reach and sort of a limited freedom with my arms. So if a ball gets too far out and another ball is too close, look how much more comfortable I could make that if I could move my center of mass over here. So if my pattern got a little bit turned, if I was on my feet, I could, I could use my extra degrees of freedom to help bring that under control and make that easier. So I think it actually might have more to do with the extra freedom that you have relative to the balls, allowing you to bring more of your actuators, your, more of your muscles and so forth, bring more things about your body to bear on the problem. 
But a great thing to do as you're learning to juggle is to practice sitting down like on the edge of a piano bench or something um, because that constrains you enough to force you to make better throws. But as a beginning juggler, and even as an advanced juggler, it's much easier to do it standing up. So that's a great question. I had to really think about that one. Okay. Uh, going back to, to airplanes, so this question, do autonomous drones or planes have feedback control? Tremendous amounts of feedback control. In fact, if you buy a drone, the, what made drones usable by everyday people was the fact that the sensors, they're called IMUs or inertial measurement units that, um, that are in your cell phone that allow your cell phone to know, for example, uh, you probably have a picture up. Let me see if I have a nice picture that I can show. So here's a picture of some stuff out in my backyard. If I rotate my phone, how does it know to rotate the picture? Whoops, there we go. How does it know to rotate the picture? It knows that because inside there's a gravity sensor, which is part of an, an overall, um, an IMU. I can shake my phone and it'll do undo because it can sense that fast motion. So that, uh, those really inexpensive, very accurate inertial measurement units are measuring constantly the pitch of your drone. And a little control system is saying, I'm pitching too far this way and speeding up that propeller to, 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 to catch it up and, and stabilize it. So feedback control is the, is the magic sauce that makes drones work. We have a question of why didn't the fish stop moving its fin when there was no moving water? Yeah, it's an amazing question. And you would think that it would be just a horribly inefficient thing to do. And I will say that different species solve these problems very differently, which is why I study a whole bunch of different animals. Um, so before I answer that question, I'll, I'll give an example. Cats and squirrels both climb trees nearly equally well, but everybody knows that you don't call a fire department to get a squirrel out of a tree because the squirrels can come down pretty much as easily as they go up. And so it's by studying the comparative difference of the biomechanics, mechanics being sort of the physics and biology, the integration of the biology and the physics of a, of a squirrel that's a little different. A squirrel can take its back paws and turn them around uh, and therefore grip the tree as it's coming down in a way that a cat just can't do. So you can now see this clever biological trick that affords a little bit more uh, maneuvering. So some of the species of knife fish lay on the bottom when they're not moving. They don't actually do that. So your, your point is well taken and, and not all species do that, but the Eigenmania varescens or what, what's called the glass knife fish, uh, the ones that I showed you in those videos, most of them, ones, most of them were glass knives. Um, they're called that because you can see through them a little bit. You can, you can find these fish at, at, at aquarium stores. The black ghosts are the most popular because they're really cool looking, but the glass knives you can also get. Um, and uh, they, just sit up in the water column and are constantly hovering. And I think there's a number of reasons they might be doing that. They might be doing it for roll stability. Fish, most fish are not, uh, are, are such that if they stopped doing control would actually pitch up, right? So what's keeping them from pitching up could be, and I've looked at this a little bit, the angle of that fin as it's going like this can be going back and forth to kind of stabilize it like I use my legs to stabilize itself. And uh, another reason is that actually, even when the fish is sitting still, it's having to make constant adjustments. And this is the main reason I think it is. When it's trying to hide inside the tube, there's little water currents and so forth. And so it's making micro adjustments of how much of the fin is going one way versus the other. And that turns out to be a really good way to do control. So, uh, and it might not cost that much energy, just a little bit extra energy. And now it gets this really nice stabilizable system. So we have, we have a question about robots, robots and juggling. Would, would giving robots more degrees of freedom help with learning to juggle more than two balls? Oh, that's the classic question in robotics, the degrees of freedom problem. Because when you add degrees of freedom, you make the computation problem harder. So, but on the other hand, in principle, you're absolutely right. More degrees of freedom allows more flexibility, but there's a cost associated with that extra flexibility that we haven't as roboticists solved yet. So um, uh, yes, it's, I think in principle, in order to get to biological lifelike motion, we have to give robots more degrees of freedom. The problem is we just don't know how yet. So that's a great question. And that's, that could be you know, maybe your PhD dissertation someday. You know, let me ask you one, one last question, because I think you, you, had, you had suggested earlier the importance of curiosity and driving you as, as a researcher. 
what what first led you to look at at these biosystems and the connection between biosystems and engineering? I saw a talk when I was a graduate student studying juggling robots. My PhD advisor had a collaboration with a biologist studying. Uh, they they were studying six legged animal locomotion, and then my lab was trying to build the robots based on those ideas about six-legged animal locomotion. And a lot of that work has gone into Inspire Things in Boston Dynamics, for example. Um, when that biology professor from Berkeley came and gave a talk about biological systems, I just realized there was this whole different way of looking at the world. Instead of from a point of view of synthesis, which is how do you make something, but analysis, which is that there's already these incredible things that exist. Can we use some of our uh, engineering knowledge and apply that to the analysis problem. And so it was kind of, again, a little bit of luck and again, a little bit of that being able to follow your nose when a new opportunity comes up. While I was a PhD student, I didn't plan to do a postdoc in biology, but then this professor gave this talk that I was like, I've got to learn more about this. I've got to go figure this out. And so um, it was that, it was that willingness to kind of make a, I mean, it wasn't like I made a snap judgment, but after seeing that talk a year and a half later, I was in his lab. Um, so, uh, seeing how to couple analysis, that is the study of something that is, and synthesis, which is the creation, the creation of something that doesn't yet exist. You know, those are both exciting. I went into the field of synthesis because I was an engineer and I switched more to a point of view of analysis, but often using tools from synthesis to help me. Making new engineering apparatuses to study animals, for example. Um, so... Hopefully that answered that at least a little bit. Yeah, no, absolutely. Awesome. So, no, again, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, for those of you, as we end this webinar, a reminder, it is being recorded. You, when the webinar ends, you'll be directed to a page, which is where it eventually will be hosted. And uh, you know, again, this is a, a kickoff to our uh, glimpse into the intellectual life of faculty at Johns Hopkins University, and we'll expand to include CTY alum. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be our inaugural speaker. It was my pleasure. Thanks. Bye-bye.